Um, our next speaker um, comes from a different uh, perspective. Uh, so Michael's talking about the challenge of getting capital into the farm sector. Um, Barry Irvin, who's the executive chairman of Beaver Cheese, has had the challenge of getting capital into the post farm sector. Um, he's ex had ex extensive experience in the dairy industry and has been chairman of Dairy che Bega Cheese since 2000. His leadership has seen Bega grow from a small regionally based dairy company to now one of the largest dairy companies in Australia, supplying a large range of dairy products in Australia and around the world. His depth of knowledge of the industry includes a significant understanding of the issues affecting Australian dairy farmers, the infrastructure and investment required to meet changing market needs and the management of long-term customer relationships and the creation of business value. Uh, he's been the recipient of many awards for his leadership in the agriculture sector, including the NAG, NAB Agribusiness Leader of the Year in 2009 and the Rabobank Agribusiness Leader of the Year in 2011. And in 2013, he was appointed to the Prime Minister's Business Advisory Council. He also has a, a range of different community responsibilities and roles which he contributes to. And in 2008, he was awarded a member of the Order of Australia for contributions to children with disability and to the dairy industry. So to talk a little of his experience uh, in relation to uh, financing and uh, raising capital in the um, agri sector, please welcome Barry Irvin. Thanks, Mike. Look, it's great to be here. Um, I suppose in arriving at the podium, I've, I've needed to think about what I might talk about, including whether the slides are going to change for me. Or if we go the other way. There we go. So I think in terms of the story of Bega Cheese, but I'd even go a little bit further and say, you know, when we talk about agriculture, I get um, concerned that we get things out of context and I'll, I'll tell a little side story if you'll allow my indulgence. Um, I'm actually just back from walking the Camino de Santiago which is, and I'm a bit jet lagged, I mean literally just back a couple of days. 850 kilometres from France right across Spain. Um, didn't have much time because my board likes me to turn up at board meetings, I had to do it between board meetings. Um, the reality of that was two things. One was that if you decide you're going to do something like that, you should actually do a little bit of research. There is more than one mountain range in Spain. <laughs> so I looked at the book and read the Pyrenees and thought, well, I'll go over the Pyrenees just like you would go over the Great Dividing Range of Australia and then you just walk across Spain. And of course, there are several, actually five. So you have to go up and down and up and down. The company did occasionally contact me, but not very often. At some point, they got very concerned that um, with all that walking, 40, 50 kilometres most days, and all those mountain ranges, uh, my life being slowed down to five kilometres an hour fundamentally, I would have all this time to plot and plan. And that by the time I got back, I would be ready to drive everybody crazy because what else could I possibly be doing out there for all that time? And of course, the irony was that what I was doing was uh, trying to work out where I would get food, trying to work out where I'd find a bathroom, trying to figure out whether I would be actually close enough to keep walking to find somewhere to sleep that night. And more importantly, I, towards the end of the trek, I was trying to find ibuprofen most days. That was it. That was it. There wasn't anything else going on in my head. And the reason why I say that in terms of context is that I think that sometimes we overcomplicate the world. Sometimes we think that the only models are the new models and the only things we should be thinking about is, for the want of a better way of putting it, what's shiny out there and we chase shiny things. And I think that's particularly true of the current environment and the, and the discussions that go on around structure. Um, 
and indeed where you fund agricultural business from. And this particularly relates to cooperatives, where there's any number of advisors out there that will make any amount of money giving you the myriad of structures that you might like to think about if you're a cooperative. Because you need to raise capital uh, that your farmers won't necessarily be able to give you, is the, is the common line. We hear it a lot. Well, you know, the business has got all these opportunities and the farmers can't afford it. So we've got to raise the capital some other way and we've thought about all these new whiz-bang models. Um, and let me tell you that I'm concerned about them. And I'm concerned about the thinking behind that. The context that I'd like to talk about in terms of bigger cheese and why we actually decided to change structure and why I actually think this is the only reason, one of the few reasons might be a better way of putting it, why cooperatives should seriously think about what their structure might be. There's two, there's two. There's business success and there's equity. In, and sorry, I should say equitable sharing of value. So in Bigger Cheese's case, it was a very, very successful business. And ironically enough, as a cooperative, it continued to grow but the core of that cooperative came down to around 100, 120 farmers. But as a cooperative, we needed to keep taking on new members. And the speed at which we were growing meant we were going to take on new members that uh, didn't have the same equity slash history with the company as our traditional owners, shareholders did. So that was a puzzle for us. And I would just throw in a little aside here. Many years before, when I first uh, became involved with Burger Cheese, we actually did go to our farmers and we did raise capital off our farmers, off, our, off, off that small group of farmers to actually do capital expenditure and expand. We set up financing structures that actually allowed them to borrow the money to invest in Burger Cheese and, we, and, we, and that's where we started. And we then went to traditional sources, you know, a thing called a bank. And we, and we were very successful in growing this business but it became very clear that we might end up with 500 members, 100 of them with an enormous history and equity in the company and 400 with a $2 share. But they're, mem but they're all members, they're all equal members because they're a cooperative so they all vote. And they all vote equally. So we started to think about changing structure, not because we were worried about where our next dollar was going to come from or where the next piece of capital was going to come from, we actually started thinking about it because we weren't sure that ironically enough the thing that people like to refer to as the most equitable thing, a cooperative, was actually going to be equitable. So we began thinking about what would be and how we would release all that value that was created. And that's the second part of context. I always worry as an ex-banker about people that say, I can't find the money from traditional sources. Because if, if nothing else, I would start to say, we better make sure you're scratching pretty well below the surface to find out why. Bigger Cheese funded all its growth out of bank finance. Lots of it. Had no trouble. Why? Business very profitable, very strong uh, foundations. The irony was that as it grew, about 20% of its business was actually associated with farmer's milk and about 80% was associated with value adding and a whole lot of other activity that had nothing to do with dairy farmers. So again, you started to separate um, what the real business was and whether its ownership model was right. So we restructured, not in search of capital. We were very aware of a changing environment and whether our structure was appropriate for it, but the driving force was in fact release of value to our farmers and of course, uh, anybody who knows this biggest story uh, carefully realises that, or, or closely, realises that on average we leased over, you know, when the day we listed on IPO, we listed, we on average delivered about two to two and a half million dollars per farmer in value to them overnight. Of course, it wasn't an overnight success. It had taken years to create that, but we, we made it realisable. There is a third thing there that when you think about those numbers, if you don't find a way to make that value tradable, to make that value realisable, somebody will just come in and make an offer for you and, and the farmers will naturally accept. So the context of us looking for a structure was more about equity and business success than it was about 
a shortage of avenues for funds. Now, of course, when we started to think about what the right structure was, we, we, we started to, to run through all those models. And then, once we'd made the decision to change structure, it was about saying, what is the right model and why? So we thought about, of course, the market. And we all, and I'm sure without me dwelling on it for more than a, a, a minute or two, that um, you spent the day talking about the great opportunity in agriculture. You know, uh, might have even talked about a paradigm shift, might have even talked about a new base. We'll never go back to those old circumstances ever again. Agriculture will never, never have the challenges that it experienced in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. I've been around too long. I've been around too long. The most important thing, the most important thing uh, that my guys do beyond running the operations well uh, and responding to our customers' needs and our shareholders' and suppliers' needs is to make sure they understand what's going on around the world in agriculture, what each of the production segments look like. And if people think that, think that dairy is just going to be smooth sailing for the next five to ten years, wait till those caps come off in the EU and see what sort of flow of product comes on the market fairly quickly. It doesn't worry us, but nor do we live in an environment where we say it is, it is just you know, a shiny, shiny future. It is a great future with great demand, but the interesting thing about agriculture, so I'll make a very big generalisation, but I think it's very true. I think there is a misunderstanding about agriculture. I think it is one of the fastest and best responders to market signals that you'll ever see. And as soon as it starts to actually, actually drive higher margin, you'll actually see the world respond to it. And it is a genuinely, as we all know, a genuinely global market. But, we've looked, but we did look at that market and we did see that obviously there is great opportunity and there is great opportunity in dairy. And if we were thinking about a structure, what was the right structure that would allow us to quickly respond, indeed be ahead of our competition? so we could respond to that market. And as I say, we all know what's driving it. Increased GDP in, ma in, in major developing economies, um, a rising middle class, um, you know, increased uh, disposable income. You know, I, I'm, I'm sort of brutal. You know, I say, you know, unfortunately Australia is not going to feed the world's poor. It's going to feed the world's rich. And there's going to be enough of them for us to all find our niche including dairy. Australian dairy is not going to feed the world's poor. Australian dairy is going to feed the middle class's children with really good quality infant formula and we're going to provide all the, all the products, or not all the products, but our share of the products to um, fast food um, pizza huts for, for mozzarella and, and um, McDonald's cheese slices. That's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be doing it uh, for time infinitum and it's going to be a great niche for us. But and we need to respond to it. So we of course said, yep, we need to be able to have a structure that responds to that market and responds quickly. Even though we were still very confident that we could continue to get money from traditional sources. There is of course another market, financial markets. Money always inevitably follows opportunity. So I'm sure that most people that have major agricultural assets or are responsible for major agricultural assets here have their doors knocked on continuously at the moment, with people wanting to give them money in all sorts of structures. And the only thing that I say about that is that's wonderful. And you can think about any number of structures, even under our current listed structure. You can go, you can establish joint ventures to one side, you can do all sorts of things. But I, again, am always cautious in saying, um, too free a capital is not necessarily good for business disciplines. So. So just because all that funds can come in, again, I'd be a bit nervous to say, you know, that's great, but I really want to understand the strategy. Because for me, it's as much about strategy as it is about structure. So, you know, I, I, I fundamentally believe that, you know, the source of the funds uh, is interesting. The, the importance of strategy is second to none. So the reality is for us, and again, if we, if we talk about Burger Cheese, it wasn't, it's not a short-term strategy, it's been a strategy that's been built up and built up and built up 
Uh, this business, uh, when we listed it, was heading towards a billion dollars. It's now in excess of a billion dollars worth of turnover. It, it invested enormously in, in high quality plants and invested in key platforms that it believed um, were, were both appropriately sized but also an op a niche opportunity uh, for a business like Vega. So we were, we were for a very long time concerned about strategy and we continue to be concerned about strategy ahead of structure. Because if you get, if you get the strategy right, you will have any number of options around how you fund your business. Because of course, you'll be a business that people want to invest in. And I, 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 we know, and I'm sure people said it, there is not a shortage of investors. Uh, there is a shortage of investment ready, ready businesses. There is no question that there's a shortage of investment ready businesses. But the reality is, um, I think the businesses that are short of being investment ready need to get investment ready rather than just taking in capital. I think because what you end up with is disappointed investors and ill-disciplined businesses. So I'm, I'm extraordinarily um, hung up, if you like, about um, what the right strategy is. And then, you let, and then you try and manage your structure accordingly. And I'm going to move quickly to structure because I think that's really what people are most interested in. And Big Cheese is, of course, a, a great story around you know, getting the structural decision right. Uh, so there is a temptation, particularly in cooperatives and I guess particularly in large cooperatives, to fear giving up, if you like, control. And so then you see, so you see a lot of hybrid models start to, to come into play. Um, Bega went through all of them and ended up saying, you inevitably in all those hybrid models, and I'll come back to this in a moment, set up a conflict of interest. And it might be denied, it might be, it might be talked about in a different way, it might be that they're non it's non-voting equity, it can be all sorts of things. The reality is it doesn't matter if it's non-voting equity, if it's hundreds of millions of dollars and the guys managing that investment of hundred mil hundreds of millions of dollars uh, are knocking on the CEO and the chairman's door saying I'm not really very happy with my returns. Because believe me, and the independent directors that are sitting on the board of the cooperative that are saying, you know, oh look, we, we better worry about where our capital's coming from over there. There is an inevitable conflict around it. I'm saying this from the perspective of Burger Cheese. But I think it is something that is sometimes brushed over or washed over as people think that these hybrid structures um, are the answer. I, in, from Burger Cheese's perspective, they certainly were not and I think they do inevitably not deliver you what you hope for. There's nothing better than clarity, which I guess goes back to my original story of, of five kilometres an hour. But the reality is, you know, I think that, you know, so what did Burger do and why did we choose listing? Well, we wanted clarity about what we were doing. We wanted to make sure that we could actually have our shareholders realise the full value of the value that had been created. We wanted to make sure that we had a structure, structure that was, was, if you like, genuinely market ready and didn't confuse the market. So we went out there as an IPO, the market knows exactly what it's getting, the market knows exactly what it's got today. The structure suited us because we could use our paper as currency. We could indeed, and, and again if people know the history, within three months of uh, completing the listing we, we completed the takeover of the Tura Milk Industries uh, and then I think everybody was very aware that not very long after that did we launch a, um, a bid for Warnable Cheese and Butter and shook up the dairy industry um, you know, in, in a big way. And of course you can, people can see by that graph that we, we changed the value perspective of the dairy industry following that bid um, because, because we actually brought, brought the market's attention to the opportunity in dairy. So the structure suited us well, created value for our shareholders, gave us a, gave us a vehicle that uh, initially allowed us to raise a small amount of money, we raised $35 million, um, allowed us to use our, our paper, if you like, as, as currency um, and, and, and move the business forward. Interestingly, we, we, again, we weren't obsessed with saying, ah, oh, it gives us the opportunity to go and raise more capital. Of course it does. 
and it may well be that we will in the future, but the first place we go to raise capital uh, are our banks because inevitably debt is always cheaper than equity. And I'll just settle on that point for a minute. So when a cooperative says, I couldn't raise the, the, the money off my farmers, so I had to go somewhere else, and that's actually also good for my farmers because I've got my capital from elsewhere. Well, of course, if you've ended up with a hybrid structure, the farmers ultimately pay for it. Because if, if, if debt is being delivered to you at sub 5% and, and your equity investor is asking you, even if it's a note, if he's asking you for some, he's obviously asking you for something beyond that, somebody has to pay for it. Somebody has to pay for it. As I said, I don't like easy money. I don't like free capital. It's, it, it's, it, it, it's nice for a while, but for me, it's all about business discipline business strategy, it's all about saying how do you create value, how do you create value within the business which ultimately flows to it. So with Bega Cheese it was always about saying um, I'll create a structure that allows me to deliver value to shareholders. The inevitable effect of me delivering value to shareholders is that uh, the structure will attract more capital but the structure will be also able to, to borrow more money. Um, so we've been very successful. Uh, I suppose to not put too point, fine a point on it, if those shareholders that realised on that first day $2.3, $2.4 million on average, if they held those shares today, they're about $6 million. So they've actually gone for a wonderful ride. It's a great example of, of, of how you can create uh, value and build, and, build, um, and build wealth on the farm. And, and I guess to go back, to earlier, it's, it wasn't about new. It wasn't necessarily about new capital. It was about new investors entering, but you know, much very traditional investment. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I wanted to give a quick perspective. I think there's um, there's any number of structures that we can talk about. Uh, as I've mentioned, hybrid structures worry me around conflicts, and I think that uh, they are too easily presented and the impact of them is not seen for the longer term, but there are a number of very good examples where those hybrid structures have turned out entirely different from what people thought. Um, you know, there is plenty of foreign capital out there. There are plenty of opportunities to use that foreign capital. I think we do have to be investment ready to take it, and it's not just about whether they become a major shareholder of Bega Cheese or another dairy company. It can be about JVs. It can be about different structures that sit to the side of that. Um, I think there are, there are great opportunities for dairy. There's a great opportunity to respond to the markets in dairy. Um, but I think that you've got to make sure that you have a very firm, clear, straightforward strategy. And you should, I have, you know, my one, very one simple discipline has always been, if your bank's looking at you somewhat quizzically, you should think very deeply about what you do next. Thank you. Thank you.